Well, good evening and welcome to this special forum event uh, celebrating the philosophy of Hilary Putnam. As Beth said, my name's Peter Dennis. I'm a fellow in philosophy um, at, here at uh, LSE. Um, Putnam died in March this year. Uh, he was Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University. And he wrote on almost every area of theoretical philosophy, uh, particularly philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, uh, and also philosophy of science. Um, and also he wrote on epistemology and latterly um, in ethics uh, as well. Now, we can't hope to get through all of these topics uh, today. We just hope to give a few little glimpses of, of the breadth of uh, Putnam's philosophy. And uh, part of the, I would say, the joy of, of, reading, of reading Putnam, uh, we hope to uh, demonstrate uh, a little bit of that. Um, so with us to do this, uh, we have uh, Julian Bagini, who is, uh, of course, co-founder of Philosophers Mag the Philosopher's Magazine, Jesper Kallistrup, who's Professor of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, Chris Norris, who's Professor of Philosophy at Cardiff University, and Sarah Sawyer, who's lecturer, Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at uh, the University of Sussex. Um, I want to start by, or we want to start by thinking about the kind of philosopher Putnam was. Different philosophers have different approaches to philosophy, perhaps different conceptions of philosophy. Julian, perhaps you can start us off. Yeah, no, thanks, Peter. I mean, uh, you know, Hilary Putnam, we could, we'll talk later about some of the specific things he's known for in his arguments and positions. But, you know, for me, what I find most interesting about him is perhaps, you know, how he thinks rather than, than what he thinks. Because I think he exemplifies a kind of philosopher who's actually quite rare, <clears throat> but is one that we, we want. Because I think, you know, I, my general impression is that there are philosophers who are very, very good at, as it were, Argumentation. He, the analogy might have, because you know he did talk about artificial intelligence. It's not inappropriate to give an artificial intelligence uh, analogy here. There's a problem in AI known as the framing problem, which is you can get very very smart computers that can process and process and process, but actually what they can't do, is, which what human beings quite, find quite simple, is to kind of identify without processing everything what's really important and what and what matters. <clears throat> now that's kind of a metaphor for kind of a, a problem a lot of philosophers have. Some philosophers, particularly in the profession era are very, very good. You throw a problem at them, you throw the latest paper at it, they'll process it, they'll find out what's wrong with it, they'll come up with the next stage. But they don't have that sort of sensitivity for what's really at stake and important about it. And I think Putnam is one of those um, exceptional figures who has... He does have that incredible processing power. You know, he has got an incredibly razor-sharp mind, but it's a, a razor-sharp mind which is also extremely sensitive. And I think that's why, I mean, people... He, he's quite famous having changed his mind more than a lot of philosophers have done. And I, I think that's simply a product of that. He changes his mind not because that's a great virtue, but simply because if you are going to think honestly and openly, you will from time to time do it. He put it quite nicely. I, I got a chance to interview him a few years back, and and he said, I, I never thought it a virtue to adopt a position and try to get famous as a person who defends that position, like a purveyor of a brand name, like you're selling cornflakes. And I thought that, and actually that's a very apt metaphor, because if you actually think about, not so much philosophers actually, think of a lot of public intellectuals. And yeah, they have their brand, don't they? You kind of pick up the latest book and you, you know the broad thing they're going to say. And I think having that kind of genuine intellectual openness and curiosity whereby you're not interested in whether what you're going to say next is going to fit in with your brand. You're just interested in whether or not it's going to add something useful to the debate. It's a very, very important quality. I think, can I just add something? There's um, something quite interesting going on in the political arena at the moment as well, which is that if someone changes their mind, they're criticised for it. Mm. And I think it's really important to realise that people change their minds sometimes for very good reasons, and that's OK. In fact, we want people to change their minds because they're sensitive to new evidence and not just stick with what they've said before because they said it. And so I think that's, that's a really nice thing in Putnam as well. Do others of you agree that Putnam was this sort of receptive kind of character as Julian said? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's spot on. That's the way I'm reading his work as well. An openness and willingness to reconsider one's own views and perhaps adopt the opposing view if one finds the argument uh, stronger. Uh, so this is something we certainly try to teach our students. But I think it's, you're absolutely right. There's a, 
a generation of younger philosophers out there, and it's a very competitive market. Everybody is trying to occupy one's own position in logical space. Uh, so um, philosophical theorizing is a little bit like uh, having a toothbrush, isn't it? That, that, uh, in that we, we all have one, but nobody wants to share with anyone else. And I think sometimes that's a, perhaps a good thing to do, but at least try to, to think about other people's views. Um, uh, so something I always teach my students is that um, just try to occupy the opposing view or uh, someone else's view, and only then can you see how the virtues of your own view. And I think you know we can learn a lot from that. Actually, trying to understand philosophy as a dialogue rather than you know uh, digging trenches and defending one's own view, come what may. And um, so I think that's a great, great you know virtue of of Hilary Putnam. We can learn a lot from that. I mean, I think there's one, one another virtue of his, which I think is perhaps less obvious, because you know if you read his big papers, yeah, you know, they just seem to be well argued pieces of philosophy, right? And so in that sense they have a lot of the trappings, if you like, of this idea of philosophy as this, you know, entirely objective discipline where the individual thinker's contribution to it, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter who said it or when they said it. It's yeah, just yeah. the arguments, right? But actually, I think that's, that's not quite right. If you, <clears throat> if you look more carefully, you can see that Putnam was someone who always recognised, and this comes out perhaps in his, his views on language and everything, how you know, everything we do in philosophy is, in, in some sense, it is personal, it is individual, and you shouldn't kind of deny that. And there's a kind of inauthenticity about like, hiding behind the arguments as if they weren't you your arguments, as if you were simply presenting a view that was out there. And again, I, I try to just quote something because of the interview. Cause I, I've got a few things here because I did want to, to quote him. You know, we talk about these great people and then we should have some of their own words. Uh, again, this is from the interview. He said, I think that the philosopher should to some extent disclose himself as a human being. Uh, there's something, that's something that James argues in Lecture 1 in Pragmatism. See, again, you notice how this is just an interview. He's, he's, he's got this great scholarship and great stuff. He can cite you the stuff straight away. But he's not doing it gratuitously to show off. I'm paraphrasing him, but he quotes a Walt Whitman saying, which is, who touches this book touches a man. He says, in effect, that's what he wants people to say about his books, and that seems right to me. And, and just if I can add a little bit more, he says, I think there is such a thing as as the authority of not reason with a capital R, but what we call intelligence. Nevertheless, I also agree with Dewey that it's always situated, it's never anonymous. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I, I think it's partly because he felt there was a kind of professional dishonesty about a lot of philosophy. In that yeah. philosophers, um, I suppose rather like scientists, you know, when scientists write out their research they're naturally inclined to sort of cut out all the messy bits, the disagreements, the measurements that don't quite match up with the predictions and so forth. And so they present a very sort of sanitised and clinically cleaned up version of the research. In fact, they have to cut out the research procedure. Oh, I'm very sorry. Right. Could be, could be. I'll move a little bit forward. the rest forward. of it's okay. Should we... Okay. Ah. Oh, dear. Right. Right. All right, we'll try to... Is this better? This is, the microphone. is this a bit better? We'll try to do our best. Get yeah. close. As long as you don't think we look a bit funny like this. Yeah. Right, OK. Right. 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 Thank you. So, yeah, I, I think that this, this sort of habit of changing his mind came partly from his feeling that philosophers like scientists were apt to sort of tidy up their thinking processes when they, they wrote it up in the form of academic articles. Um, and what, what they should do is, is sort of lay themselves open, including their doubts, uncertainties, second thoughts, revisions, self-interrogations. Uh, he, say, he says in one very nice passage, very autobiographical in the way, we, we philosophers are apt to do a lot of thinking and worrying, and we really don't have any very clear idea sometimes of what we think. Um, and then all of a sudden we plonk for one solution or another, one idea or another. And he says well, what he wants to do is sort of open up the, the process by which you get to the point of plonking for one or the other. Yeah. And that might include a lot of changes of mind, which, uh, toward the end of his life, he, he really came to, um, to acknowledge very openly. So quite a lot of his, his later essays reflect on the processes of thought by which he's come around to, uh, to a position after a lot of uh, hesitation and uncertainty. And again, that's a very admirable thing, I think, in, in his work. I think also there's, a, is that, there's also a connection in his work between philosophy and science. So the idea is not to see philosophy as something separate from science, but to see that the two are interdependent. And so scientists clearly, he thinks, rely on some kind of philosophical theorizing when they're building their theories, they're constructing their theories about the empirical world. And 
In addition, on the other side, philosophers always draw on new scientific information when they're philosophi- uh, philosophizing as well. So that sort of interplay between the two. But, it, but in that interplay, it's important mm. to stress, I think, that it is, it's an interplay, and he is very much against this sort of idea that you know philosophy is just a branch of science. Yes, right? I yes. Mean, so it's not as extreme a stress, view like, as yeah. you get. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So in someone like Quine, I think it's it's a more extreme view. Um, philosophy is just to be seen as a branch of science. Mm. Um, but, but definitely the interdependence of the, the two, I think, is important yeah, yeah. in his work. Chris, could you tell us a little bit about Putnam's views on science? And perhaps that would be a way of illustrating one area where Putnam was willing to change his mind. Hmm. Well, the, the early Putnam, up to, I suppose, the, the late 1970s, was a realist. A realist about a whole bunch of things, but especially about the physical sciences. And he thought that, um, well, he thought that scientists uh, were in the business of trying to talk about the real things, objects, properties of them, dispositions, um, a whole bunch of objectively existing objects and features of objects. And obviously he recognised that science doesn't have all the answers, that the history of scientific, um, well, scientific discovery was littered with, um, with errors or partial truths or distortions or sort of sharply limited states of understanding. Um, so he recognised what you might call the argument from error, you know, the fact that since scientists have got a lot of things wrong in the past, as we can now recognise, so, you know, it, it would be hubris for, for, for the present generation of scientists to think that they got everything right. On the other hand, he thought that science as a whole, if you look at its history, exhibited a fairly, well, not what you call steady progress, you know, the the sort of faltered and there were sort of um, bumpy passages and uh, it was error prone. But um, he thought that um, on on balance, um, science had had exhibited a a pretty good, steady and reliable pattern of, of progress. And he thought that science was one of the places where philosophers could look to pick up their criteria for what counted as uh, if not a true theory, at least uh, a decently falsifiable theory. And this is just the place to talk about falsifiability because uh, Pop- Popper, who was one of the great uh, philosophers of science in recent times, uh, taught at the LSE and introduced this idea of falsifiability as the criterion of a good scientific theory. Uh, Putnam subscribed to that very largely. Um, and he thought that in order to understand the history and the um, uh, well, the nature of scientific discovery, you had to be a fairly robust kind of realist. And he wrote a whole series of essays collected in a well-known volume in, published in 1975, um, not only to bear that out in a general way, but to provide, well, an epistemology and, and a metaphysics to go along with that. Uh, and this, he thought, required looking at language, the way language worked, especially the way that referring expressions worked in language. How do we refer to things? And the dominant theory at that time was called descriptivism. And it came down from Russell and from a German logician, Frege. Um, and it basically said we refer to things by having a bunch or a cluster of descriptions in our heads, attributes of those things. Uh, and when we refer to things, then um, we apply those descriptions and the descriptions taken together enable us to pick out the objects. So, for um, example, just yeah. to give an example, if I wanted yeah. to refer to you, if I said the professor of philosophy at Cardiff, university yeah, that's and right. I had that description in my head then that would kind of pick out that's it you. yeah but then what happened in the mid 70s was that two two philosophers Putnam and a guy called uh, Saul Kripke um wrote, um, the, well, in Crippy's case, a book, and in Putnam's case, a series of articles, pointing out real problems with that. They said, well, the descriptivist theory gets us into big trouble because, for instance, if we use it to describe, um, let's say, apply it to a proper name, Aristotle, and all of a sudden we discover that our entire body of what we thought was knowledge about Aristotle, that he was taught by Plato, that he wrote the Metaphysics and various other books, um, all of a sudden fell apart with, you know, through some absolutely earth-shaking discovery. We discovered that, in fact, Aristotle had done none of those things that, by which we had up to then thought that we'd picked him out as a unique um, historical individual. In which case, we would have to say Aristotle isn't Aristotle, okay, or wasn't Aristotle, because the descriptions no longer would fit... Um, Um, any uniquely historically existing individual. Uh, So they came up with an entire different um, Kripke and Putnam between them, but Putnam in a more sort of um, usefully illustrated and striking and um, memorable way. Um, A whole battery of arguments to say the descriptivist theory doesn't work. What happens, they said, is that objects, natural kinds, prototypically, and um, proper names... um, 
um, are, are inaugurated by a kind of um, baptism. In other words, someone says, this is Aristotle, you know, his mum and dad, presumably. Uh, someone says, this is gold, let's say, if we think of a natural kind, a metallic element. And then our state of knowledge changes vastly. You know, at, at first gold's thought of as just this gold-coloured, soft, ductile metal. Then, then we, we achieve more knowledge of it. We recognise it dissolves in a certain acidic um, um, uh, a, a certain kind of acid. We recognise eventually, with a further advance in scientific knowledge, that it has a certain um, atomic number, which enables us to pick it out with much greater accuracy and distinguish it from, say, fool's gold, which looks very like it. Um, and so um, the, the word retains fixity of reference through all these great scientific revolutions. And this, this was thought of as, as a, real, a real advance. That there, are, there are problems with it. Um, you know, there are still defenders of the descriptivist view or the view that we need both elements of both theories, the new theory of reference, so-called, and the old descriptivist theory, to really understand how referring terms work. But my point is that, that Putnam introduces this because he thinks it gives us a good, solid um, <clears throat> linguistic and metaphysical grounding for the notion that scientists are in the business of talking about the real world. They may understand it in very partial ways. They may require a great deal of sort of tweaking and refinement of existing state of knowledge uh, in order to introduce new advances. Nevertheless, there's continuity and there is a degree of stability in our usage of certain terms across and despite these real sort of shake-ups in the state of knowledge. And that's the background to a whole series of thought experiments. And Putnam's terrific at devising really interesting thought experiments. Um, and he's making a big claim. He's saying we can find something out by theorizing in our armchairs. Big debate nowadays, how do you best do philosophy? Is there any place for the traditional philosopher who sits in his or her chair and just does these sort of mental operations and claims to establish truths through them? Putnam says yes. Putnam says you can, you can at least pick out a bad theory by sitting in your armchair running a thought experiment and showing how that theory runs into real problems so if I've understood because you said it, you've said a lot there just to, to sort of summarise a little bit the idea is that for Putnam scientific progress can be understood as a way of kind of refining our language's ability to pick items out in the world or perhaps our ability to pick yeah. out and distinguish uh, say gold from other elements and other other natural kinds, and that's how yeah. we can get the measure of how science moves forward. Yeah. So a term typically comes in in a rather vague, hazy, sometimes metaphorical sort of way as a kind of all-purpose stopgap descriptor for something we don't quite understand yet. And then gradually the bad terms get winnowed out because they don't sort of measure up to the observational evidence or they don't fit into any coherent theory. Um, and the good terms get progressively refined and narrowed down and specified more accurately. Um, I suppose classic example is atom, you know. So the ancient Greeks come up with the idea that somehow matter must be subdivisible into ever smaller chunks of matter. And so, so through purely sort of speculative armchair philosophizing, they get to the notion of an atom. <laughs> Uh, you know, an indivisible little chunk of stuff. And obviously our ideas about the structure of the atom have changed, um, you know, beyond recognition since then. But the name sticks, you know. It's, it's, we're talking about atoms, just as the ancient Greeks were talking about, or at least some of them, talking about atoms. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was just going to say something you said at the beginning. There was a lot in there, but just um, with respect to... Um, scientific practice and realism. So in philosophy, we have the, the question of realism arises in lots of different contexts. And in philosophy of mathematics, for instance, philosophers are interested in, in the question of whether numbers or sets or other abstract objects uh, really exist, um, not in the sense that we can sort of you know, run into them or hit them, but in, a, in some abstract notion of existence. Um, and so um, one famous argument of Putnam's is that, uh, called the indispensability argument, is that we, if, if we, we can be committed to the existence of numbers if, um, if they are, play an indispensable role in our best scientific practices. So it's very much the starting point is the scientific practices and see what, sort of imp how that can feed into our philosophical theorizing. Uh, so that's one way perhaps one could settle a dispute that otherwise would have been very abstract and theoretical, in that we can look to the working scientist and see are they quantifying over numbers, the sets, and so on, and does that mean we're really committed to them? So this was an argument that he did, following his, his PhD supervisor, Quine, that you also mentioned earlier, that he developed in some detail and, and defended and, and has been very influential. So there's an example of that, uh, the, the notion of realism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Shall I pick on... So pick up on the idea that um, 
we can have theories about a kind of stuff like atoms, for instance, that change, but nonetheless be talking about the same stuff and tie it into the twin Earth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which, so. Um, so I think in, in the early 1970s, there are a couple of papers that Putnam wrote. Meaning and reference is one of them, and the meaning of meaning is another. And there's a really interesting thought experiment that's laid out, and it's, it's a nice example. It's easy to get your heads around what's going on. But there are two key, two key claims that come out of it, and I'll tell you about the thought experiment in a minute. So the two key claims are, first of all, that two individuals can be talking about the very same phenomenon, even if they have different sets of beliefs about it. They have different bodies of information, different theories. And that allows for the ancient Greeks and us to be talking about the same phenomena, stars maybe, or whales, even if we have radically different theories. And the reason for that is, in this sort of realist phase, is you're connected to stars causally. You can see them. It's those things we're talking about. And you're connected to whales. It's those things there that are swimming. So if you change your theory from, oh, it's a fish, to, oh, it's a mammal, that's okay because it's still tied down to the things in the sea. Um, And the other key claim is that two individuals can actually have this very same set of beliefs, what looks to be the very same theory, even if the two individuals are talking about different things. So there are two ways in which the theory that you have and the thing you're talking about can come apart. So two individuals can have the same set of beliefs but be talking about different things, and they can have different beliefs but be talking about the same thing. And so this comes out in this so-called twinner thought experiment. So Putnam asks us to imagine a place that's just like Earth in many, many respects. So on Earth, there is a, on Twin Earth, sorry, there is a place called London. There is a lecture theatre like this. There are people who look like you sitting in it. And there are people who look like us. And we're tipping our glasses and we're drinking the liquidy stuff in it. And the one difference that Putnam says we're to imagine is that on Earth, the stuff in my glass is water. It's H2O. We know that now, right? We'll take that for granted. There it is. It's water. It's H2O. On Twin Earth, there is no water. There's something that looks like it something that tastes like it, something that functions like it, it boils at the same temperature, and so on. We can drink it if we go there. We can wash in it. It runs in the rivers. It rains, this stuff. But it's not water. Because on Twin Earth, there is no water. There's nothing which is H2O. The stuff that looks like water over there has a different chemical composition. So it's very long and complicated. So Putnam says, we'll just call it XYZ. So the watery stuff over there on Twin Earth is XYZ. And the idea is that you can now imagine... Uh, me sitting here and my doppelganger over there with exactly the same movement. So every time I do that, my doppelganger does that. Every time you nod, your doppelganger nods. And the idea is that because I've been causally connected to water, when I use the word water, I mean water, and I'm talking about water. But the person over there, there's no contact with water, so they can't possibly be talking about water. They must be talking about their other stuff, and we'll call that twin water so we know it's different. And so the idea is that causal connections to the world make a difference to what you can mean by your words and to what you can talk about. And so it's that kind of causal connection to the world rather than just what's going on in my head and what beliefs I have that determine what I can think and talk about. And I think um, what you get there is me and my doppelganger both have exactly the same set of beliefs. We both think this is watery stuff that you can drink and it's tasty and refreshing and you can swim in it and so on but we're thinking about different things and talking about different things. And you also get the other claim, because on Earth, if you go back to 1750, let's say, the people didn't yet know that this was H2O, but nonetheless they were still talking about water, which is in fact H2O, even though they didn't know it. And so those two claims come out quite nicely, I think, in that thought experiment. I mean, what I find, one of the interesting aspects, I think, about this approach to language. I think it exemplifies uh, something about the broader approach, and I'm afraid all my points are going to be about broad approaches, right? It's fine. Uh, it's it's fine. doing nothing about detail. But uh, I think if you look at sort of philosophy of language during the 20th century, I think you, on one side you've got people perhaps starting with Russell and everything who really kind of dreamed of, of, of pinning things down in a very, very precise way, you know, to sort of like try and explain how meaning works in a way which would crack it and would sort of almost turn it... So it'd be like logical mathematics in a sense, you know, it could be that precise. And then against that, you eventually got, in reaction to it, perhaps, you know, Wittgenstein, who's, you know, everyone's got their own interpretation of Wittgenstein, so I hesitate to say what Wittgenstein's view was. <coughs> 
you know, broadly speaking, as a view of, of you know, language, the meaning of it, the words is used in language is a famous sort of slogan. Now, the Wittgenstein strikes many people as being just too vague, too open. It doesn't really say enough. On the other hand, the former approach seems to be have an aspiration for precision in the philosophy of language, which, which can't be achieved. Now, I always quote Aristotle because Aristotle <clears throat> said one thing which... <laughs> Should be at the sort of like the, the, the top of the page above the door of every philosopher, which is that the mark of the trained mind is only to expect as much precision as the subject matter allows. And the thing there is not to use that as an excuse to be less precise than you can be, but not to, to be more precise than you can. Now, it seems to me that this kind of <coughs> the philosophy of language that Putnam sort of developed was kind of occupying that ground. It was, it was very kind of, it was, it was rigorous, it was trying to be precise, but it always allowed very explicitly the fact that. You know, you can't take away the element of human judgment. So if I can just sort of quote again how he explained this in interview. He, he said that w- what we say a word means, or what we take the sense of a sentence to be on a given occasion, that's very often a judgment as to what it's most reasonably taken to mean. And that is essentially normative, meaning, you know, it's a matter of a, a making a judgment about value. So, you know, these examples about are we talking about the same thing or not when we're talking about water and so forth. You've given two examples where perhaps it can be reasonably clear but he's saying even those clear examples we we can't ignore the fact that you know the theory just doesn't deliver the answer on a plate you have to use your judgment to decide whether or not it's the same thing and and it's it's a nice sort of jokey example of this it comes from Hugh Mellor Hugh Mellor um, said something along the lines of there is such a thing as phlogiston you know, uh, it's valence electrons. <laughs> so the idea here is that the phenomena which both phlogiston and oxygen were invoked to explain are phenomena that invoke valence electrons. Right? Now the point is we don't we don't now say that's phlogiston. Right? We've kind of but that's a kind of judgment. We made a judgment that that term isn't useful. It should be superseded by the next one. But sometimes we decide the old concept. It could just be revised if it's our new understanding. Sometimes we decide the old concept has to go. And, you know, the way Putnam's theory works is it, I think it makes it very clear that that decision, you can't get away from a judgment. You can't just sort of pretend that, you know, the laws of semantics are going to tell you what the right answer is. So we've kept whale, for example, but we've given up phlogiston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, ma'am. You were just going to say... Um, that I mean, the, the, the thought experiment that Sarah outlined has been incredibly influential in philosophy of mind and language and cognitive science and just throughout philosophy. People talking about a, a, you know a twin Earth style thought experiment and then off you go. Uh, but but the, the, the the key idea is, as, as Sarah explained, it, that, that you fix everything as it were from from the inside and then you ch- you you make some you, you change the the, envi- the physical environment or social environment uh, in some cases in some ways in which the the agents in question are, are not aware of and then thereby you can then change the way. The, the, the meaning of their language, what language, language they're speaking. Um, but, but it was interesting when, when you talk about judgment, because there is indeed scope for convention and judgment. If you go, Sarah was talking about going back to 1750 before we discovered the microstructure of water. I mean, you might say back then we may, perhaps we had a different concept of water. So he's clearly making some assumptions about the sorts of concepts that we have. They aim to pick out underlying essences, the concepts of tiger and elm tree and water and so on. But perhaps back then, when we didn't have the right, you know, chemi- the right sorts of chemical uh, uh, knowledge, we had we deployed different types of concepts. So, so we make, need to make a decision about which sorts of concepts are we using? Do they change as we acquire more uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, and so on? Uh, so I think indeed there is very much scope for for, for those sorts of considerations within his philosophy. Yeah, I, I think, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, the, the twinner thought experiment, as you said, has been enormously influential. Yeah. I mean, even in metaethics, yeah. you know, it's, it's just gone yeah. viral, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is no philosopher in the world, yeah. I think, that doesn't know about the twinner thought experiment. But um, I think the, the, specific, the, specific, um, sorry, the specifics of that example um, are relatively clear cut. Yeah. And, and other examples get very messy, like yeah. you said. So, and you do yeah. have to make a judgment on occasion about whether the concept has changed, whether yeah. the meaning of the term has changed, whether the reference has shifted slightly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not an easy question, I think, whether <clears throat> Newtonian mass and Einsteinian mass is the same mm. phenomenon, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and so, and part of those decisions, I think, have to be made with a view to the theory as a whole. 
and how those concepts play a role in the theory as a whole. And that is something that Putnam's quite yeah, keen yeah, yeah. to emphasise. It's, it's the theory taken as a whole that you need to consider, not just an individual term or an individual concept, precisely because they get their meaning partly from the theory. But I do think it's important that um, Putnam was going against a very strong t- tradition mm. where the main assumption was that as long as you had a change in belief, a change in information, mm. you thereby had a different meaning mm. automatically. Mm. And what he's saying is that that's not true. Mm. You can sometimes at least, and in many very interesting cases, have the same meaning even though there's a slight shift in the information. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that's coming out of our discussion then is that Putnam isn't just somebody who was willing and open to other points of view, willing to change his mind, but he was also open to different areas of philosophy. So there's this thought experiment in the philosophy of language, which you could really see as a very small debate between, say, Putnam on the one hand and... Frege and Russell or descriptivism yeah. as you yeah. mentioned it within the confines of philosophy of language yeah. could each of you say a little bit about yeah. how this thought experiment within the philosophy of language which is just really about this question of is meaning in your own head or does it depend on the features the layout of your environment how is it that that is, comes, comes to be so applicable even to metaethics and all these other areas of philosophy yeah I can't speak to ethics but I can certainly say about, about a number of other areas so what's so <clears throat> the initial argument of the initial thought but was it within philosophy of language narrowly construed so it's about the meaning of our language of the words we're using such as water and so on as Sarah was explaining but very soon the philosopher was very quick to extend his conclusion in various ways so another philosopher, American philosopher called Tyler Birch Argued that um, if the you know the if linguistic meaning is is wide or depends on the environment in various ways, so is um, the contents of our beliefs, because we we the, the sentences that we are used to report those beliefs will will, will they have their meanings determined that way. So will the, the the contents of those beliefs themselves. And so it, it looks as if now it isn't just that we can fix beliefs. The, the beliefs themselves will also depend in various ways on features of the environment. People, uh, Birch also argued that it isn't just it isn't just that our beliefs depend on you know features of the physical environment, but also on the way we're using language. And he had another thought experiment to illustrate that. And um, the, so, th- but these were all sort of about content, so linguistic content, or uh, the, the meaning of language, or, or mental content, the contents of our beliefs and desires, and so on. Um, so the, the the last sort of. Um, Extension of this is what is, what is now known as ve- vehicle externalism. So as opposed to the, the contents of the language or thought, you could also extend, as it were, the, the vehicles that run the contents. So up in Edinburgh, where I work, there's lots of interest in the extended mind uh, hypothesis, extended cognition. So the vehicles that run our contents, say, uh, so in most cases, it's just our, our organic biological brains. But nowadays, we all used to iPhones and the rest of it. And uh, philosophers are now arguing that these can serve as vehicles that can run content. So mental and cognitive processes can extend into, into the environment, the immediate environment. And resources that we carry around with us uh, at all uh, at all times. So it's, it's very exciting. And cognitive science has huge ramifications throughout. Um, yeah. Do you, do you yes. think that's a, an implication that Putnam would have approved of? <laughs> yes. in mind? I, I, Is that I, taking I, I, it too I, far? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't know, but I don't see why not. Because I mean, one thing that did become a kind of recurring theme was this this sense of. You know the holism of his thought, which is the idea that you know things depend upon things outside of ourselves. Meanings depend on on context, and 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 later on he got more and more impressed on the need to understand context. And and you talk about you know we, the extended mind thesis is about as kind of if you like contracting out our memory to our iPhones or our diaries or something. But actually, there's a more. He he said quite early on, there's, there's a fundamental sense in which we contract out a lot of um, linguistic work at all. So he has this phrase, the uh, division of linguistic labour. So the idea there is that I can use words like I can use words like falcon, right, and and sparrowhawk and everything, right. I can use those words, but in a sense. 
said is I can only use those words because there are other people who have an expertise that I don't have which can actually understand the difference between them, right? <laughs> I know there's a difference between them, but I don't know what that difference is. And, 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 and so it, 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 the ability to use language fundamentally depends upon the fact that we don't have to store yeah. everything in our own heads. Mm. And uh, it's not just the environment which helps define it, the fact that water is in fact H2O. It's also the fact that other people are carrying around more d- detailed knowledge. So, you know, that's a kind of, you know, extended... It's you know, that, that extended mind thing. My me- meanings aren't in my head, they're in your head, and, well, they're also in iPhones, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Putnam's really opposed to a long tradition in Western philosophy then, which is very individualistic, where the contents of my mind is determined by my own sort of inside my own brain, and he's saying that, that actually that's not the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Chris, could you, we're talking about these, sort of this, this twin earth thought experiment, how it applies in these different areas of philosophy. Could you say a bit more about how it applies in philosophy of science? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it basically says that um, we're on pretty good solid ground. We can put up good, robust arguments in defense of the idea that... that so most scientific terms in a mature scientific theory typically refer to the things they're talking about, which in a way would seem sort of self-evident. But there are a lot of other developments, opposed developments in philosophy of science that take a much more sceptical form and that say that, well, for instance, there's the, the argument from error, which I mentioned um, earlier, <clears throat> which um, basically comes down to the idea that since scientists have been wrong or only very partially right, you know, for a very large part of scientific history about a very large number of scientific topics, therefore it's overwhelmingly likely that they're wrong about the majority of things now. Um, Putnam was always sturdily resistant to that sort of idea. But you find very sceptical constructivist positions. So a constructivist would say that... Um, Theoretical entities of uh, you know un- scientific unobservables like atoms that can't be directly observed you know except with the they can be observed through very powerful microscopes and or things too far or too tiny or too big or too fast or for us to to see or perceive um, there's a strong constructivist uh, um, tendency well sometimes called constructive empiricism after a philosopher called uh, Bas van Frassen, which says, well, we shouldn't uh, postulate their existence. We shouldn't go realist about them. We should treat them as more or less useful, convenient, um, theory-supporting um, posits or constructs out of our best current, which might not at all be um, valid or reliable scientific knowledge. So there's a kind of deep... Um, laid scepticism which issues in various kinds of anti-realism or conventionalism or paradigm relativism of the kind that's often um, attributed to it to Thomas Kuhn the author of a famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions which would say that scientific realism is really a rather naive and old-fashioned and uh, credulous sort of philosophy of science. And some of these anti-realisms or constructivisms have, have taken very elaborate and very sophisticated forms. And what happens in the later Putnam, well, from the middle period Putnam on, in, into his, his last work, is Putnam's response... Am I jumping the gun here talking about this? Uh, no, go ahead. Putnam's response to various kinds of... Um, of attack, really, or, or potential quarters of attack, on his early realist position. And he, I mean, my, my own, you know, I, I recognise that it's a really good thing that Putnam was so prepared to criticise his own previous <clears throat> views and change his mind and be open to the whole range of counter-arguments and objections. But the line, I, I wrote a book about, about Putnam, um, which basically said that he, he didn't really say he should have stuck with his early position and not being quite so uh, prone to, to chronic doubts on the topics. But um, obviously there's a lot of real interest and highly sophisticated argument in his later work. But I think his early position is much more defensible and much stronger, certainly on scientific ground, uh, than some of his later, um, what, what I would see as a series of retreats. What happens later on is that Putnam goes through a whole series of alternatives to what he came to regard as his own... Um, I suppose, overly robust or um, overly unquestioning um, uh, realist position. He tries pragmatism. He tries a kind of what he calls natural realism in some of his later work. Um, he tries internal realism, which is framework relative. In other words, you can be realist, if you like, about certain objects or events or properties or whatever you're talking about <clears throat> scientifically, but it will always be specific or internal to a given framework, a framework of judgment or inquiry or priorities or a 
a research program, if you like. Um, so you can't be a, a kind of um, all-out realist. You can't be a realist... Um, a sort of sans phrase, but you, you, you have to be specific about your realism. It's realism relative to a certain set of scientific interests or purposes. Um, and he, he, he works through that, and he, I mean, he, was, he, was, he was impressed by a lot of counter-arguments. Some of them came from philosophy of language, um, various kinds of, of um, language relativism, if you like. Um, he was never overly impressed by the late Wittgenstein, who was mentioned earlier. He, he didn't go in for the idea that science only makes, or scientific statements or theories only make sense within a certain cultural form of life or a certain language game. He saw that as too relativistic. He thought that if that were the case, then it would undermine any, any claim of science to represent the world as it, it truly is. On the other hand, he was highly impressed by um, some of the arguments against his own early realist position from within philosophy of language. Um, he was highly impressed by problematical results in specific scientific fields like quantum, quantum mechanics. Uh, he felt that uh, the, the famous paradoxes, paradoxes at least from a, a, a classic realist position, of quantum, um, quantum field theory especially, um, posed a very large problem for any kind of straightforward defense of an objectivist scientific realism. <clears throat> he was impressed by paradoxes, the paradoxes of set theory, for instance. He was impressed by what he called the Polish logicians problem, which has to do with, with numbers and counting and the fact that there are lots of different ways of counting a group of objects, five objects, if if you like, if you count them one by one, but on the other hand, there's those five objects plus the various groupings within the five. Um, so he thought that um, even the he thought that realism in philosophy of mathematics was hugely problematic. Um, Anyway, I sent him my book, and uh, he didn't reply for a long time, and I think part of the reason was he felt that I'd um, more or less sort of praised him for his early work and then thought he'd uh, sort of retreated into uh, various other substitute positions which didn't work out, so quite understandably he wasn't too keen on that. But, um, you know, I, I would want to defend the early, the early Putnam for all the interest and the resourcefulness and the, the brilliant ingenuity of some of his later um, arguments, trying to accommodate these objections, I think he possibly leaned over a bit too far toward accommodating them and allowing them to undermine some of his own stronger early claims. Can Sarah? I just pick up on yeah. something to do with quantum mechanics? So one, of, one thing I think that's quite interesting is that often we tend to think that there's something about mathematics or logic which is special and it's different from the sort of subject matter that you have in science. So there are claims about the world, like there's a couple of glasses on the table, or scientific claims, like electrons have spin, there's gravity, and so on. And these are all claims that could be true or false, and you have to figure out which are which. And the, the, the claims in mathematics are supposed to have this sort of necessary status. They're, all, they're necessary truths, and you can't question them. And one of the things that's interesting about some of Putnam's work is the questioning of that division. And the idea is that when you construct theories about the world, like scientific theories, quantum theory, for instance, um, that can give, I mean, the observations you make in experiments can give you reason to change your mathematics and change your logic because part of the point of mathematics and logic is to structure what you're doing in the empirical realm. And so that relation, I think, is quite an important relation. So it's, so it's a willingness not to see mathematics as something that you can't touch, but it's part of the theory construction. And so plausibly, we can actually revise our mathematics if it will help scientific enterprise. I think that's... So maths and perhaps philosophy gives you a kind of structure through which you can look at the world and get your empirical results, but yeah. you might get some empirical results that don't really fit with that, and then you've got to... So there's this kind of... So you have to change the background framework oh, right. of the maths and the philosophy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. We're going to take some audience questions at this point. Um, if you're <coughs> confused or um, uh, disagree with anything that the panel say or would just like to raise a point, uh, then please raise your hands and uh, I will direct uh, the microphone to, to come to you. We're going to take, um, say, three questions in a row and then I'll, I'll invite the panel to, to answer the questions as they, as they can. So there's a gentleman right in the middle to start off. <coughs> Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask the panel how uh, Hilary Putnam dealt with the world of imagination and the reality of things there. And, and of course, there's a, and there's a very good example in the arts, uh, very similar to the, the H2O example that Sarah Sawyer was giving by the, uh, the, the, uh, the conceptual artist Michael Craig Martins, 
uh, experiment in changing a glass of water into an oak tree. <laughs> uh, but I'd like you to hear what you think about Putnam and the World of Imagination. Okay, thank you. Is there an- another question? We can take a... Right next to... Yeah, that didn't have to go very far. That's good. Um, th- thank I, I'm talking about the, the two worlds... And I, I have just, just heard about this problem tonight, and I'm not very impressed with the way it's put forward, <clears throat> because somebody is telling me that the water on Twin is not the same as the water here, but where's that person standing? Okay. Who is that person who actually knows that? Yeah. And it seems to me that the two worlds could be in communication by spectroscope. So you, in each world, you, you electrolyze your water into two elements, which are gaseous, and our 16-fold difference in density, and you put them in a spectroscope, and you transmit that light information to the other planet. Both of them do it, and they find it's the same things, and they can look at the spectrum coming from the other planet or from their own planet. So they can talk to one another, but the third person who you are, I don't know where you're standing to know that this water is different. Yes, Yes. good question. Is Is there a third question? Yes, right up here on the left. Thank you. Um, my question is about the last comment uh, made about the maths uh, that's related to, I mean, uh, about the science. So as we get new data from uh, empirical evidence, I mean, we get new empirical evidence, we kind of change our maths to soothe that. But isn't uh, the, the actual framework the same? For example, we take, uh, say, quantum mechanics, we use um, vector spaces and so the vector space, I mean, the, this, the maths of vector spaces doesn't really change. It does, we just apply it in, in a different way. So, uh, yeah, my question is, how does the last comment actually um, uh, apply to, I mean, if you could expand on that, on the last comment? Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's first come, first served, so... I'm going to answer the question about the water case because that's something that um, struck me as interesting. I think that is a good question. I mean, in terms of the standpoint, it has to be a theoretical standpoint. So you're looking back and observing the two worlds. The the standpoint gets quite... um, There's a tendency to think the standpoint gets complicated because you're looking down on a world which you're a part of. But what you need to do is, is... just stand back and think of two worlds and because you're a theorist and a thought experiment you get to stipulate that they um, are functionally identical to all intents and purposes that if the individuals, the the twins Oscar and twin Oscar, as Putnam has it were switched, they wouldn't tell the difference switched in their sleep, they wouldn't be able to notice any difference but nonetheless there are underlying differences that potentially science could get to and I think that idea that they're is more to the world than we currently know and that there are substances that could look the same to us but turn out to be different, I think is a fairly intuitive one. And that's all you need, really. The the thing about the water case is um, it's not a very good example, as many people have pointed out, because we're partly constituted of water, right, (laughs) largely. And so the actual example doesn't... I mean, often what you find in philosophy is it's the structure of the argument that matters. It's not really the specific example. So, um, you know, you can talk about gold and fool's gold. You know, some people were obviously not able to distinguish them at certain points in certain conditions, but they're not that similar in a way. I mean, you know, it's fairly obvious how how you can distinguish them. But you can always get lookalikes of things. You you can always get, um, you know, um, one person walking in and they actually have an identical twin brother that you've never met and didn't realise existed and you could be mistaken. So as long as there's that possibility of a difference underlying that's not manifest to you, then you can get a twin earth thought experiment up and running. In terms of communication, you can just stipulate no communication. Um, The other other thing is with, with Putnam, the way he set it up, he did talk about a planet that you could get to. So there was the possibility of communication in that example. Um, More recently, people tend to think of the situation in terms of the planet and then a counterfactual situation in which things are slightly different rather than two planets where you could travel between the two. Um, So a counterfactual situation is just, you know, I might have worn a purple shirt instead of a blue one today. That gives you a counterfactual situation. But it's not that we can get there because it's not a concrete place. So... Hopefully that addresses some of your questions. Still hesitant. 
I was going to say there's also a, a third way to think about Twin Earths. You can think of it as a candidate for our world, for how things might turn out, actually. So you could, you know, very, it, that would be very surprising, but you could well wake up tomorrow morning and read in Nature that you, science made this huge mistake that actually water is XYZ and not H2O. What would we say then? Right, so that's another way you can think about Twin Earths. So there are lots of ways you can, you can imagine this scenario being played out depending on whether you think of it as a remote planet in our world, whether it's something that is merely possible or yeah. whether it's actually something, this is how things might be in actual fact. Yeah. It goes back to Julia's point that maybe um, in different cases it calls for judgment to decide. Because in the right. case you I just think, described, we I may be less again, inclined to say all the water's yeah. disappeared on Earth. We're more likely to say, as you yeah, say, well, they've got it wrong. What science it turns out not to be You know, with yeah. Um, yeah. the Pluto, the, you know, the, the dwarf the planet, planet. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's a yeah. decision. What we're going to... Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, so it was a planet, then it wasn't, then it, <laughs> it was wasn't. Dwarf, yeah. 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 Can I just say that, in fact, astronomers rely on the fact that when they see uh, lights from distant planets and stars and whatever, it actually does show that the uh, stuff that's made of is not like what we've got here. Mm. That is actually... Yes, yeah. yes. There are a couple of other questions on the yeah. table as well, so feel free, other panellists, to jump in on the Twin Earth. There's also, there was also a question about imagination. Does Putnam have anything to say about imagination and the artist Michael Craig Martin? Um, and there's also a third question uh, on the table, um, and this is to do with how we change the theoretical structure to fit the experiment, something like this. Right. He, 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 I, I, I don't think he ever addressed um, what's now called um, ontic, well, structural ontic realism, or ontic structural realism, the kind of thing that uh, people in Bristol, like James Ladyman, are talking about. But I think, given his background in the formal sciences, and uh, he. he Obviously, you know, he was a pretty good logician and something of a mathematician, too. He'd been quite sympathetic to that idea. He makes a lot of use of um, <clears throat> appeals to logic and to arguments within formal logic and the interpretation of formal logic um, in two different ways, really. Partly, I think, as a kind of... Um, <coughs> Uh, a kind of anchor point, I think, to avoid some of the wilder gyrations of sceptical theory, um, but also as, a, again, a kind of a source of counter-arguments to his own earlier positions. And so, uh, you know, he will typically appeal to um, quite technical counterfactual considerations, um, for instance, from the, the more speculative reaches of, of quantum theory, to raise big problems. So, you know, his entire early position, as arrived at through the Twin Earth thought experiment, is called into question later when he speculates, well, you know, maybe water, maybe we just can't refer to water as a natural kind because any given instance of water is probably a superposition of, um, of, uh, of H2O plus, you know, H4O2, etc., various multiples thereof. So any appeal to natural kinds that stipulates, as he did in his early work, that we can identify them and pick them out um, as distinct uh, substances through some sort of appeal to the, the essence is, is very shaky, he would later say. So, yeah. I was just going to say, just on the, um, the specific point of whether Mars is um, subject to empirical revision, as, as uh, Sarah was kind of explaining earlier on, I think in epistemology, the theory of knowledge, we have a distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori. So the a priori is knowledge you can have independently of empirical investigation or observation. So knowledge you can have just from the philosophical armchair, as it were. And I think one lesson is here that he was very skeptical about that, whether you could always draw that distinction. So he famously also gave some really illuminative uh, examples. Uh, that, that, so he said, for instance, how, how can you rule out that um, you know, cats aren't robots or something like that? So the, the world could turn out in surprising, to be surprisingly very different from the way we take it to be. And that's not something you could you know just by analyzing cats or water or things like that. Yeah. They, could just, you know, they could turn out to be very, radically different from the way we take things to be. And so I think he was very concerned about that particular distinction uh, to, because of the, the way you know, if math is, it, it can be revised. Uh, empirically, then we can also doubt these sorts of um, the, the conceptual truths as, as many philosophers have thought they were. I, I think, yeah, I mean, picking up on that point, I think it seems to me that as long as there's a possibility of ignorance... <sighs> to some extent, in a subject matter, you've got a possibility of revising your beliefs. And it may be that actually 
um, there's a lot of knowledge in maths, and there's much more knowledge in maths than there is in science, for instance. But that, it doesn't follow from that that there's no ignorance at all. And I think it's, that possibility of ignorance will always push you um, to say there's a possibility of revision here, even if actually it's unlikely that we'll revise it or um, you know, we haven't yet seen how we could revise it. There's, it's just ignorance, I think. Because it might all be, driven by ignorance. <laughs> we might be tempted to say, well, cats are mammals, and we can just work that out from the meaning of cat. If you understand the meaning of the word cat, well, you know they're mammals. But as you're saying, you could, find, you could discover. Yeah. And that's, that possibility of discovery is always, it's always there for Pam. Yeah. 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 And that, that is true in logic as well and logic yes, and maths as well, as, well as, as in, in the, the empirical world. Right yeah, world yeah exactly yeah. and is yeah. that a defining feature of Putnam's philosophy or is there, well, other kind of philosophers at the same time kind of thinking well, similar ideas he's I mean Quine yeah. has the same kind of view possibly a more extreme view about the relationship <laughs> between philosophy and science but Quine has the same view but they're, they're writing at around the same time I think and they're reacting against the same kinds of um, theories that were there before them. It's, it's sort of set in a historical context. Um, and so, yeah, so Quine is also someone who believes that nothing is immune to revision. Um, I'm putting it in terms of ignorance, but I think that that's one way to understand what's going on. Possibility of revision everywhere. Well, think, about, think about, like, in, in an encyclopedia and a dictionary, okay? So you, you think that we can find any definitions in a dictionary, we can find empirical facts in, a, in an encyclopedia, we can look it up online or whatever. But perhaps that distinction isn't very clear, right? <laughs> if the sorts of information you would find in a dictionary is equally subject to revision, then maybe that's not so obvious. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point, actually. I mean, it's not something I'd certainly want to emphasise, that dictionaries record what we take to be the truth, really, yeah. But they don't state the truth <clears throat> unless we've got it right. And we may very well have got it wrong. And so that's why dictionary definitions are updated, um, partly because people start using terms in different ways and we have to track actual usage. That's fine. It's recording usage rather than dictating it. Um, certainly recording it in certain areas, maybe by the experts and then dictating it to others. Um, but the, the meaning of a term, I think, is tied to the dictionary definition, and that will change as our theories change. Mm. Yeah. Well, I want to move us on, if I can, to another of Putnam's thought experiments, and it's Putnam's, it's the, the headline thought experiment in our, in our title of this event, Brain in a Vat and uh, Other Stories. Jesper, could we start okay. with you? Tell yeah. us what this thought experiment is, uh, so, if you don't know already. Yeah, so like the, it's a little bit like the, um, the twin of thought experiment. It's, it's a fairly sort of simple idea. It um, was introduced in his book, Reason, Truth and History, from 1981, I believe, at the very beginning of the book. And um, the thing to bear in mind is here what, what Sarah was also talking about earlier, uh, that Putnam is assuming that in order to be able to uh, to think about the world or to represent the world or for language to, to um, you know, to, for words to refer to things in the world, there has to be the right sorts of causal uh, connections between the user of the, of the word or the agent in question and the sorts of things in the world that you are talking or re about or trying to represent. So he, at the beginning of the book, he gives the example of an ant that craw that's crawling in the sand, and it just so happens that it draws a caricature of Winston Churchill in the sand. Uh, you know, you can imagine the waves happen to fall in the sand in such a way that there is a caricature of Winston Churchill in the sand. And Putnam says, surely this particular uh, indentation in the sand is not a picture of Winston Churchill. Why? Because the, this particular, this ant has no, doesn't sustain any causal relationship with um, Winston Churchill or any pictures of Winston Churchill or what have you. It's just a, a, entirely a coincidence. So there's a sort of causal constraint on on the, one's ability to use language to refer to things in the world, to talk about things, to represent the world. Okay? And the same was true with the, in the, in the Twin Earth case, remember, that on Earth we talk about water because that's the sort of thing we drink and swim in, and on Twin Earth they talk about twin water because that's what they drink and <laughs> swim in and so on. And so that's, that's sort of the first thing to bear in mind. And then he's, he imagines the following, again, it's another thought experiment. Um, and it's a little bit like Descartes' uh, evil demon, if any of you remember this or have read or heard about him. So um, it's a sort of a, a radical, skeptical hypothesis. And uh, so you to imagine the following, okay? So um, one night you're, when you're asleep, um, an evil scientist removes your brain from your body and immerse it in a, in a vat full of um, uh, 
life-supporting liquids, nutrients, and so on, and, and, and uh, connects it up with her, to her uh, this super powerful computer. And then the, um, the computer uh, feeds you all these information, all the experiences that you would uh, normally have were you uh, and perfectly you know, an embodied human being walking around, sitting here right now listening to me. And so the, the question is, how can you know you're not a brain in a vat? Okay, how can you know that? How can you rule that out? You might say, well, I can just pitch myself or, or you know, I can wave my arm because brains and vats don't have arms. But of course, that would just be the sorts of experiences that this evil scientist would feed you uh, if you were a brain in a vat. So it's not something you could, as well, rule out um, in that particular way. So it's a kind of a, a radical skeptical process. How can we know this, uh, this isn't the case, that we're not all subject to such uh, investment? Um, and it's a kind, of, kind of familiar in, from Hollywood films. So if you, any of you have watched The, the Matrix or, or what's the other ones? Um, uh, the uh, Truman Show. So sort of these sorts of radical scenarios in which one is deceived by by some evil demon or evil or, 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 or scientist or what have you. Okay, so we're sort of familiar with this from from uh, from the literature and movies and so on. And so that's sort of the setup. That's the thought experiment. This seems to be, although I'll be a, a bit outlandish, it's not sort of uh, violates any particular laws of nature or anything. So it's something that's kind of coherent. It's something we can imagine. But in the case, indeed, we can envision, envision this in, from, from films. Um, but then Putnam says, given this particular causal constraint and reference that I was just told, telling you about uh, a minute ago, Putnam is arguing that um, if this hypothesis um, uh, were true, we couldn't even think that we were subject to this sort of uh, this kind of deception. Okay, so our ability, so it's sort of a precondition on our being able to think that we are brains in rats that we are not. Okay, and you can kind of see why. Okay, so in order for for me to think about uh, trees and tables and brains and mats and so on, I have to causally interact with these sorts of things. Okay, so it doesn't mean that I, you know, perhaps I've never actually. Um, it doesn't mean that you know I can't think about uh, a gold mountain or things like that. You know, so you, could, you might say I just need to have the right sorts of causal connection with uh, the constituent concepts. But in this case, there are some basic concepts with which I have to have had the right sorts of causal encounters in, or, in order to to uh, to use these words to refer and talk about tables and trees and vats and brains and so on. But of course, if I were a brain in a vat, then I wouldn't have those sorts of causal, the right sorts of causal connections with um, the things I now have, I now cause to interact with. So a brain in a vat couldn't possibly think those sorts of thoughts. Right? So therefore, given that I can think those thoughts, that, that I can entertain the very p- hypothesis that I might be a brain in a vat, I can rule out that it's true that uh, I'm a brain in a vat. So it's a kind of, um, it's a semantic argument in the sense that it's using considerations about meaning and language and representation to rule out a radical skeptical hypothesis in, in epistemology, in the theory of knowledge, you might say. Um, so that's really sort of the setup. I can say a lot more about this. Um, you might well ask, um, but what if I were a brain of that and I, and I just ran through this argument? Well, what could the brain of that possibly be talking about? Well, it would be talking about something else. Maybe... Um, when he's using the word uh, brain in a vat, he'll be talking about brains in vats in an image or in the computer program or electric, uh, the way it's been stimulated electronically or what have you. But he, he couldn't possibly have those sorts of thoughts that, I can, that an embodied human being can have. So if the brain in a vat were to say, suppose I utter the sentence, brain in a vat, then he'll be talking about something else. Okay, so you can then say whether you're a brain in a vat or not, this, you can rule out this particular process because you can only... You can only think that thought if you're not a brain in a vat. So that was really the idea. And you might think, well, why is this, you know, why do philosophers get so excited about this? Well, it really kind of goes back to the, um, this, the notion of uh, realism and metaf- the, the, this sort of radical metaphysical realism that Putnam was, very, uh, Putnam was uh, advocated early in an uh, uh, earlier stage in his career. This idea that, that you know, the, the world is out there, objectively constituted independently of us, um, this sort of notion of think, think, think about reality in that way give rise to skepticism because how do you, you know how do how can you um, how can you come to acquire knowledge of the world if it is really constituted independently of the way we think about it? Okay, uh, and what he was trying to show is that 
that this realist position, this strong metaphysical realist position, it, it can't really be true because we, we are so tightly connected up with the way we think about the world that we can't make sense of, of our representations coming radically apart from the way the world is. So you could kind of one way to view this argument is as an argument against. Um, this, this notion of metaphysical realism. Nowadays, it's heavily debated within epistemology, which is an area the, in which I'm working, uh, although uh, many epistemologists use the thought experiment slightly differently. Uh, they don't sort of say that, um, they don't respond to skepticism about knowledge by, by, coming, by, by citing these semantic considerations. They, they tend to uh, put forward a, a theory of knowledge that would, that would uh, rule out these sorts of uh, skeptical hypotheses. Does that help? Yes. <laughs> okay. Help so, okay. Yeah. Does it does it help you? Others of you? <laughs> yeah. I think I think that that's one of the key moves. I think is that in the traditional um, skeptical debate, the idea is that the thoughts and experiences that you have now could be caused by two completely radically different situations. <clears throat> On the one hand, they could be caused by me talking and waving my arms around and moving. On the other hand, they could be caused by an evil scientist probing your brain. And Putnam basically says that assumption that the same experiences and thoughts that you have could have two completely different causes, one the causes that, of me moving around and the other just scientists manipulating your brain, is false. Because if there's a different cause, there's a different set of experiences and a different set of, the set of thoughts. So if you can think, oh, I might be a brain in a vat, you're guaranteed yeah. that you're not. Absolutely guaranteed. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it simple beautiful. argument, it's I think. Simple, yeah. so, so we're not brains in vats. It's great. <laughs> Skepticism. At least given what you mean by the term brain yes, in a vat. Yes, yeah. It doesn't set to rest all kinds of skepticism. No, no. That's the worry. Yeah. Because the trouble is, of course, if you think of the brain in a vat... That when they think to themselves, oh, I might be a brain in a vat, what they really mean is, I might be a brain in a vat in the image or something like that, as Jesper said. And it turns out their hypothesis is false too. Yeah. So they've also ruled out scepticism. Yeah. But that can't be right because they're not in a good situation, right? We don't want to be like that. And yet they've still managed to rule out scepticism. So there's something dodgy going on with the argument, basically. Yeah. yeah I mean, do, do, but you, you advocate. Do you, do you both buy it? Do you all three buy? Because I, I must. I've never. I've, I've always smelt a rat with this um, thought experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it quite works. I think. I think. Yeah. What or it kind of some, it says certain things that are true. That in a sense, you, there's a me, real sense in which a person who is a brain in the vat and a person who isn't a brain in the vat couldn't have exactly the same thought, etc., etc., etc. But I don't see how it gets around the problem of I don't know what kind of thought I'm having if I have yeah. that thought. Yeah. And that seems to me the problem. But anyway, I mean, this is, this is such a difficult one to get through, but even though I don't buy that one and I've never really liked it and everything, um, Colin McGinn, in a review of one of Putnam's book, said that his biggest, his fundamental problem with Hillary Putnam is he cannot bear to be boring. <laughs> and I think, and, and that's a kind of a, a, a sort of backhanded compliment to criticism. It's almost like, what well, perhaps it's sort of semi agrees with what Chris was saying that, you know, he was trying to change his mind too much, trying to challenge himself too much. But anyway, I think it's, it is quite a good backhanded compliment because even though I don't buy this, you certainly can't call that thought experiment boring. So, <laughs> I absolutely agree. So I think we have a long, there's a long tradition in epistemology and theory of knowledge about skepticism. So this, this idea that, you know, how could you possibly know you're sitting right now listening to me rather than you might be asleep or you might, you know, you made an error in the past and now why do you know you're not mistaken now? And there are lots of skeptical arguments um, out there. And um, um, I think, I think what, if, if the argument is successful, I think it raises another problem, namely it might, it might help us solve skepticism uh, about the external world so how do you know the, the external world is, is, is in the way you take it to be? But it gives rise to skepticism about the internal world. So you will talk on a little bit about this. So how, how do you know what you're thinking, right? If it is the case that your thoughts are determined by you know, the underlying essence of water or what have you, how do you really know what you're thinking? Like back in, 19, in 1750, did they really know what they were thinking? And so, there, so philosophers have now thought that semantic ex externalism, which is this, uh, this idea that Putnam have been advocating that there are these causal constraints on on thinking and using language to refer to things in the world um, might help us with skepticism about the external world because we're now so intimately connected with the world we can only think things given the way the world is. But it gives rise to uh, a worry about how can you know what thought you're actually thinking yourself. So there may be you replace one type of skepticism with another type of skepticism. 
Yeah. Can, I, can I, before we, I definitely want to sort of get in uh, before we finish, because uh, you know, think about this thought experiment. It might seem to be an example of something which actually Putnam was against. So I'm, so I'm going to read a few more things there. He says, contemporary analytic metaphysics has no connection with anything but the intuitions of a handful of philosophers. It lacks what Wittgenstein called weight. And I know that when, <laughs> some, when sometimes people think about you know, thought experiments like this, they get that sense. Now... I think that'd be unfair in the case of Putnam because you know he, he he always even when he's led to arguments which may seem fanciful, I think it is always rooted in something important, something <laughs> genuine. And again, he he said, I'm reading from this book, Renewing Philosophy, by the way, which is a later work of his, a very very interesting book. And you know he does say his best philosophical reflection can give us an unexpectedly honest and clear look at our own situation, and not a view from nowhere, but a view through the eyes of one or another wise, flawed, deeply individual human being. Now, the, the reason I want to stress that is that what's kind of not at all evident in most of Putnam's work is, is politics, right? But actually, we know he was very, very political in his life. You know, he, did in, he was very, very engaged in the anti-Vietnam War movement and everything. He was, he was basically he was reading from the Little Red Book at some stage, I think. Um, and and, and there was, I think there was a real deep political commitment, even in the work which doesn't seem political, because it's this commitment to a kind of measured rational discourse. And actually, I hadn't looked at this book for ages. I looked at it before I came up today. There's a passage in the last page of this book, which could have been written for today, right? Election Day in um, America. <laughs> um, he's, he's talking about Dewey, Dewey's conception. He says, on his such conception, it would be fundamentally misguided to think that majority rule by itself amounts to democracy, a majority which does not listen to opinions it finds uncomfortable is not engaging in the intellectual conduct of communal inquiry any more than is an elite which does not allow the majority to decide. And the intelligent conduct of communal inquiry is what democracy is all about for John Dewey. But I think he's agreeing <laughs> with that. So, you know, I, I think it's really important to see that the kind of commitments he has to his manner of doing philosophy and the openness and the engagement and the, the imagination to see the other side, to always question yourself and flip it over, is actually f deeply politically important and really necessary because what he's talking about here is not real democracy is the way that damned election's gone. <laughs> I, I think but to some extent he was disappointed with the way pragmatism of the, the, the kind that he admired I mean the William James and Dewey but especially the James tradition in pragmatism had been as he saw it hijacked by a kind of neo-pragmatism that really came down to a kind of uh, consensus politics it's, it's, he, he had a kind of running um, this kind of running subtext of, uh, of debate in Putnam with, uh, with <coughs> Richard Rorty and Rorty was the most um, sort of overt um, neo-pragmatist. I mean, Rorty thought that in the end, consensus values as defined by a specific society, a specific culture at a given time, were the, as far as you could get in justification, you know, um, what, what's... It's, it's the idea that in the end, nothing may... You, can, you can't have radical criticism of a given social system from within, because if, if you or, or from outside for that matter, because if you don't share a certain amount of fairly basic beliefs with the rest of that culture, your, your uh, opposition won't have any traction. It, it, won't, it won't count as being, um, as offering valid arguments or criticisms from the viewpoint of those whom you're addressing. And that kind of neo-pragmatism, I think, uh, Putnam felt was, was really harmful. On the other hand, I think he, he had a deep um, admiration for the, the, the sort of founding figures in American pragmatism, for Dewey to some extent, on the social philosophy side, and with William James in, in philosophy. Um, and, and he felt that there, there'd been a, there, there was a real sort of disconnect between, but within that tradition. He has, a, he has um, a little sort of spat, really, with Rorty in one of his essays, where he says, well, OK, let's imagine. Let's imagine one RR. He doesn't actually name Rorty, but he, <laughs> RR pretty clearly stands for Richard Rorty. He's being tactful, I think, Putnam is. Um, and he says, OK, so Rorty says, um, in, in a very nice sort of plural to, uh, pluralist, tolerant, open-minded way, uh, you know, beliefs are internal to cultures. There are as many cultures as 
there are uh, as many cultural belief systems as there are cultures of people who hold those beliefs. Um, and we have to recognize and celebrate the diversity of world, world cultures because ultimately what counts as true or valid or progressive or politically acceptable is going to be defined within a certain set of beliefs that define the nature of a particular culture. And Putnam says, well, OK, let's look at the consequences of that. Suppose um, RR, who just happens to speak for and from within uh, a very powerful world-dominating culture, that of the US, um, says in, in this uh, sort of liberal, tolerant way, OK, let's acknowledge the multiplicity of the world's cultures. But ultimately, this means that RR is going to judge the world inescapably from within the particular world picture, along with the political priorities and the, uh, the sort of geopolitical assumptions of that very powerful culture, in which case the other cultures, you know, for all uh, RR's uh, liberalism and pluralism, are not going to get much of a look in when it comes to issuing the, the to um, um, sort of resolving these issues on, on the world stage. And um, I think that, um, you know, in a sense, Putnam felt he'd been cheated of the, the, the one native tradition he might have really espoused and felt confident and assertive about it by the fact that pragmatism had turned into, into neo-pragmatism and had become much more relativistic um, in, in the process. Yeah, so the basic idea that agreement does not mean truth, right? We can all agree and yeah. still be wrong. Mm. I think that, that's an yeah. important point. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good point to bring in the audience. Uh, we've just got 10 minutes uh, for some questions. We'll see if there's agreement or, or disagreement or questions or, or, or something else. Um, truth, take, not truth. Yeah, <laughs> truth. <laughs> uh, not forgetting truth. Uh, yes, gentlemen, towards the front. Um, Julian spoke a bit... Is this on? Yeah, just... Thank you. Uh, Julian, you spoke a bit about uh, his concepts of what numbers are... I didn't really follow that. Could I ask you to elaborate a bit more? What numbers are? Yes, the nature I, of numbers. Were they real things? I think you did touch I didn't talk about that. No, it was... It was, it was <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, mathematical realism. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. just an example. So he, he's famous for his um, indispensability argument so that um, we have a debate in philosophy mathematics over the existence of abstract objects, whether they generally exist or just... You should just be nominal. Yes, and um, so the, the reasoning, the, the argument is to say uh, if um, the best scientific practice uh, uh, suggests you, you need these, they're indispensable for that particular practice, then you're sort of committed to the existence of numbers. So he was looking to, to, to working scientists to see were they talking about numbers, quantifying over sets and so on, and if indeed they were, then maybe that's a good reason to think they actually do exist. Um, I think, again, that's actually... What, what was your, your question? Was that... I think, yes, I think that was the question. Oh, OK, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I don't fully understand it yet, but so so, th I if I understand I you correctly, he sort of thinks there is, there is a... Uh, when we talk about numbers, uh, and uh, then there is something going on there externally that's constraining. Uh, so that implies that they do exist in some sort of way, doesn't it? I think. Yeah, I don't know if it's externally. I mean, it's the, the, the our best theories. If they, you know, we, do they talk about sets and numbers and so on? And if they are independent, if we could do, if we could do away with them, if we can, if it has no particular uh, impact on the way science works, then maybe we don't need numbers. But if they are indispensable in that sense, then he thinks we are also ontologically committed to them in that. Let's see if I we can squeeze in. Sorry, uh, do you I was just, just going to say that. That's right. so, so Quine has a similar argument yes. about numbers as well. So basically the idea is um, what you think there is, what they think exists, depends on your best theory of experience, effectively. Um, so your theory that will allow you to predict certain phenomena. I mean, we all know what will happen if I let go of this. We know it will drop. And that's, you know, we've got a reason, explanation for that. And it's part to do with gravity and so on. Um, and the thought is that very crudely, you can't do science without maths. You just can't do it. And that means you've got reason to think numbers exist too. Uh, in the same way that you've got reason to think electrons exist, if you think they exist, then you've got reason to think that uh, he, numbers exist. So you're really worried about numbers, though. He edited that well, collection yeah. of essays on philosophy of mathematics, and really they all centred around... What he saw is yet another of these big problems for any kind of realism, and this was that you can either be an objectivist, which really means a Platonist about numbers, they have objective existence, numbers, sets and classes and so forth, but then we wouldn't have epistemic access to them. You know, they'd, be, they'd sort of float free in a metaphysical realm of their own. So we'd never get mathematical knowledge. Or you can say mathematics is basically mathematical knowledge. 
In that case, in some sense, we create numbers and we create the relations between numbers and we construct mathematical systems of which we sure to have knowledge because they are in some sense products of human creation. But then you don't have objectivity. You don't have uh, standards of mathematical validity. You don't have the very basic idea that most mathematicians share that we're discovering um, truths in mathematics. You know, we're sort of pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. We're not simply inventing as we go along in a kind of intuitionist way. So and he that, found this deeply puzzling. It was one of the big things that induced this sort of self-questioning. So in that sense, you're right that numbers are this kind of external constraint mm. that we mm. discover and constrain. Mm. Yeah. That would be a sort of realist sort of... I just thought, I depend on what you mean by external, I just thought if it's... It's not the way we sort of coarsely intact with them. <laughs> It's not, they're not external in that not sense. Sort of physical, no, yeah. no. Mm. Um, let's see if we can squeeze in. I'll be ambitious and go for two more questions if there are uh, two more questions. We haven't had anybody from this side of the room. There's a gentleman right there. Yeah. I'd please someone mention democracy because that is a great stake at the moment. Um, of course, it was uh, Democritus who lived before Sophocles who um, invented democracy, and, but he had, he followed the ancient uh, idea that who pays the piper calls the tune. Otherwise you have chaos. So um, democracy originally was, uh, say, the House of Lords, you see, hadn't made all the money because they had uh, property, etc. They had all the power, so we had a democracy. But um, as soon as you have one person, one vote, the big problem is that uh, you tend to become a tyranny with the envious majority. OK, let's just let's see if we can squeeze in one more, because we're very short on time. We'll try to address both. Uh, yep, there's just one hand here, yep. Um, yeah, the brain, I'm not, <clears throat> sorry, I'm not completely convinced by his instant refutation of the brain in VAT mm-hmm. theory either, because if you tweak it slightly to, say, one of the other versions like Matrix or The Truman Show, ultimately isn't it the idea that the external reality outside of our brains is vastly different from what we think it is, but ultimately our beliefs and meanings are still going to be caused by that external reality? So that basically causes this, causes this sort of openness to revision or ignorance yeah. in that <clears throat> the external reality probably is vastly different and we can't prove that it's not, but the causal relation between our beliefs and our definitions of it still comes from that. So even if it was a deceiving demon, we'd have some knowledge of his deception and surely that, is, that would be our external reality and the reality on there. Yeah, okay. Good. We've just got five minutes to go, so it's help yourself for the speakers <laughs> on either of these uh, questions, if you'd like to. Yeah. I mean, do you want to...? No, go ahead. OK. So, yeah, I mean, without having to sort of uh, go through the entire argument again, I think you're right in pointing out that it's certainly possible to tweak the argument so that the conclusion wouldn't follow. So, so it, it very much depends on the, the scenario in question. Uh, I mean... Uh, if you were to sustain, if you were sort of very recently <laughs> put this, in this predicament, then you would still be able to think about, you know, uh, bats and brains and trees and the rest of it. And so then in that case, Putnam's solution wouldn't work at all. Uh, so I think it very much it depends on the details of the thought experiment, that, wh- whether it's successful or not. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I think w- what that shows you is that um, you can't take it seriously as a refutation of scepticism. It, it looks like that's what it is. It looks, but the funny thing about scepticism, I think, is I mean, I think it works actually, but against that hypothesis, I'm quite happy, and I think you know what you're thinking and everything. But um, I I think the funny thing about scepticism is that um, the sceptic scenarios are put forward, and the the um, theories of knowledge are supposed to be. Constructed so that you can hold on to knowledge, even though, for all you know, you could be a brain in advance. So that's quite a hard um, sort of middle position to occupy. So you're not supposed to be able to refute scepticism, 
but you have to create a theory of knowledge according to which we do know that we're sitting in a room, even though we don't know we're not brains in vats. So it's, it's an odd balance to draw. Yeah. But if someone comes along and, and <coughs> refutes scepticism too quickly, you just think, no, nah, I can't be right. <laughs> yeah. so, so you're not even allowed to do it, really. It's, not, it's a very I was strange say, this is like, dialectic. As you can hear, this is very much sort of a live debate amongst philosophers. Sarah and I have both contributed to this debate. Here's a, an example <laughs> of... Uh, this, I think it was published last year. So and this is know, called The Brain in a Vat. called The Brain in a Vat, yeah. So it's, you know, amongst professional philosophers, they take this very seriously. <laughs> I mean, just one other, other point. There's also a distinction to be drawn between Putnam's original thought experiment and what epistemologists have done with the thought experiment. So Always. they've kind of run away <laughs> with it and made it into this kind of real robust sort of argument mm. against scepticism. And, and Putnam, it's unclear whether he really intends it to be an anti-skeptical he argument. Yeah, he didn't. He yeah. didn't really. Right. It was much more about realism, I think. In, okay, in or, or yeah. the making a point about externalism in the case yeah. of your your yeah. perceptions and whether it you could have the same content of your perceptions if yeah. you were that's uh, right. a brain of fat. So yeah. even if you don't buy the conclusion, there's still something. There's still something in there for yes. you. Oh yeah, very much. Yeah. 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 Well, that's perhaps a good point to. Uh, to leave our discussion, an invitation to further reading, unless there are other points the panel would like to... Well, I, I, I will just say one, one brief comment on the democracy issue. I think the notion of democracy is actually much more complicated than people often take it to be, and I think your question brings that out quite nicely, and I think it is something that we should probably, as a democratic group think about individually what what is democracy and what are the implications of it and not just take it for granted that our system is perfect so again we can be ignorant about the best system of rule as well and in Putnam I think it connects with the question of scepticism and other minds and I mean he compared with the 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 current promoters of externalism I mean for instance uh, Chalmers for instance um, (laughs) (laughs) um, they're always talking they're always talking about iPhones and computers or Uh, or notebooks I'll tell you notebook and rest but it's always objects external objects that you Mm -hmm. carry around that form that are more or less sort of prosthetic extensions of your mental processes they have very little to say about intersubjective Um, sources of, of knowledge. And the, the, the problem's constantly talking about it. You know, so, so though he says we've got to have specialists around who know the difference between a beach and an elm, he also says we float around in a general willingness to make sense of language, and this involves the linguistic division of labour. Mm. And there's something inherently democratic about that, mm. I think. You know, but we're, we're, we're crucially dependent upon other people and on collectivities. Yeah. Yeah. If we can't get them to work and if we can't understand each other across cultural differences a bit better, then we're going to have disaster. That's a background assumption, I think. So cooperation at the heart of everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's draw our discussion to a close and thank our panel.